The topic of my lecture today is future scenarios for the European Union. My name is Johanna Aunes Loma. I'm the director of European Studies at the University of Helsinki. And now in this last lecture of this course, we will look into the future. But before we look into the future and try to see uh, what is happening in Europe and in the European Union and what might become, let's see first briefly what the present looks like. The European Union and Europe has experienced a severe crisis over the last years. The crisis has been declared over several times already now, and it seems that there still is a great uncertainty about what is going on in Europe today and how far is the Euro crisis over. In many ways, I think, if we think about the current discussion about the state of the European Union and the state of European societies, the economy, we could say that the glass is either half full or half empty, but which one is right? As I said, just, as I just said, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso declared the crisis over already a year ago in 2013. The euro crisis is over, he said. He referred to the calm in the financial markets that had started in the previous autumn after the European Central Bank had intervened in the crisis. Just days and weeks ago, he repeated the message saying that he believed this will be the year that will turn the page on the crisis, meaning that the worst of the crisis was over and the year 2014 would see or be the beginning of a brighter future. But then again, we have more pessimistic views or cautious views as well, such as the ECB chairman Mario Draghi, who said on the same day as Barroso made this announcement that it's too early to declare the crisis is over. Was and is the European economy on path of growth? What are the systemic risks still perhaps remaining in the banking sector, these are the kinds of things that uh, Mario Draghi has been thinking about and referring to when making that, that statement. And then there are those that who don't, do not really want Europe to survive in its current form from the crisis, like Marine Le Pen from France, uh, the populist politician, uh, said on the same day again when Barroso and Mario Draghi were talking that she didn't expect anything from the European system except that it explodes. So we can still see how different views are about where Europe is today and not surprisingly there are quite different views about the desirable future for Europe which is the topic of today's lecture. Okay, how do we look into the future? We can't really see into the future. No one is a prophet in this, in this sense. There's no certainty about our views about the future, but nonetheless, this is something that we constantly do, not only as social scientists, but also as citizens and politicians uh, in particular need this kind of uh, capacity to anticipate the future. We can use several methods and approaches to do that. We can analyze current trends. We can use historical information of what has happened. And then combining this information with an understanding of the logic of, of change, with theoretical and conceptual understanding and tools, we can make predictions of, of those trends. We can make forecasts of the economy. We can use population trends to try to imagine where those trends might lead into the, in the future and, and so forth on in various fields. But this is all, always a retrospective analysis. It's historical data. We don't really know whether the future will follow those trends, but then we need an understanding uh, about the, the logic of change uh, to interpret these, these trends and see if they indeed lead to where they seem right now. 
The second approach is something that we can look very carefully at the present and not ignoring the history and past development, but we can try to make a cross section of the present. We can try to analyze where we are right now using a multiple uh, array of variables and indicators and also different kinds of information and data about society, politics, the economy. Here we can look for weak signals, something that really hasn't happened before, something new that might be an indicator of a new and emerging trend, uh, a real change that then will lead to a reassessment of, of how the future would otherwise look like if we ignored those weak signals. Well, then using these two methods and, and probably others, we can make scenario exercises about the future. We can then try to analyze, but also to imagine how the future might look like. We don't know, but we would prepare different scenarios of alternative futures. They could be analytical, using data, theories, different kinds of information, and they might tell us uh, what may happen. But this kind of scenarios can also be normative, meaning that we could try to see how the future should look like. This is something that is, that is usually the task of politics, to imagine those futures, uh, to imagine utopias, desirable futures, but then also dystopias, futures that we do not want for, for one reason or another. Hence, we may have to do something today to avoid those dystopias coming through, coming true. Okay, before going into, into uh, the future more deeply, let's briefly look back, some years back in time, and see how did the future look like at some points of the crisis that started in earnest in Europe in 2010. It's interesting that these kind of predictions about the future has been a constant feature of the crisis itself. A lot of predictions have been made about the future. A lot of utopias and dystopias have been outlined during the crisis. Indeed, this has been one of the features of the crisis, that there's been so much uncertainty about the future that it has led various actors and institutions to de think deeply and hard about the future. One example of this kind of uh, thinking is the Europe 2020 strategy that was adopted by the European Union in 2010. The work for this strategy naturally had been done before the crisis. But it's interesting that its timing coincided rather well uh, with the beginning of the, of the bailouts in Greece in 2010, in the spring 2010, when the European Commission launched the Europe 2020 strategy in March 2010. Uh, with the, the subtitle, A European Strategy for Smart, Sustainable and Inclusive Growth. You can find this document easily uh, on the internet. The second example of this kind of uh, predictions made during the crisis is the one is a United States uh, exercise, American exercise conducted by the National Intelligence Council in 2012 uh, with the title Global Trends 20. 30 alternative worlds that was, was, was discussed widely when it was uh, released in 2012. If we look more closely into what was said in these, in the, these uh, predictions or in these strategy papers, you may remember this already from previous discussions or, or in, from the debates of the last years, but there's a famous, famous graph in the European Union 2020 strategy outlining the three scenarios for Europe by 2020. In the scenario one, uh, Europe would return to sustainable recovery and, and uh, what the recovery here meant was the recovery from the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. So Europe would basically uh, uh, ride the storm seen from the perspective of 2010, 
survive the financial, the global financial crisis that started from the from the United States, and then it would would go back to uh, to this uh, pre-crisis growth path, path and actually uh, indeed uh, overtake that uh, path. The scenario two, called sluggish recovery, again referring to Europe's uh, Europe's uh, recovery after the financial crisis of 2008-2009, would see Europe lagging behind the pre-crisis growth path, but nonetheless a growing, a gr having a growing ec uh, economy and basically uh, an economy that might fulfill the other goals uh, of this 2020 strategy that was that were rather ambitious if you remember and then the, the third scenario there was some kind of a horror scenario in this uh, strategy the lost decade scenario where as uh, as an outcome of of Europe's certain vulnerability in the financial crisis, it would have suffered a permanent loss in wealth, a potential for future growth, and Europe's uh, growth pattern would be substantially lower than the one it was on before the financial crisis hit Europe in 2008. One of the weaknesses of, of this uh, strategy from, from the, 20, uh, the 2020 strategy was, the, was the, that it could not really see the euro crisis. It nonetheless is implicit in the text and, uh, and it, it can be seen there as well, but this is one of the, the major weaknesses of the strategy that it could not really analyze for natural reasons because it was launched before the worst crisis hit, uh, that it could not really analyze uh, the, the outcomes and the, the developments and, the, and what, what followed uh, the euro crisis of 2010 and 2013. If we then, then look at the American views that were presented in the Global Trends 2030 report in, 2000 and, in 2012, uh, we can see there a basic assumption that despite the current uh, difficulties and, and, uh, and hardship in Europe as a result of the combined effect of the financial crisis and the euro crisis, the assumption nonetheless was that Europe would remain a great power in 2030. But there were still conflicting forces of fragmentation and integration that would make Europe an inherently unpredictable actor on the global and international scene. And this was because it really wasn't a political union. It didn't have the political unity to make it really an effective global power. It would have a lot of power due to its economic wealth and its population and its position in the European in the in the world financial and economic system. But in this uh, scenario exercise the National Intelligence Council carried out, all the experts agreed that in any case the Europe of 2030 would look very different from the Europe of today. Big changes would take place was the consensus analysis because the experts saw uh, Europe's main weaknesses to be structural. Europe's productivity was in decline already before the euro crisis and before the financial crisis. Its global competitiveness uh, was growing in uh, to a negative direction and Europe had unfavorable demographic trends and these were processes and changes that were going on already before the crisis and would be something Europeans would have had to tackle in any case, had there been a crisis or no crisis. On top of that, the US experts saw the euro system being a dis dysfunctional, it rather heightened economic uh, differences within the European Union than, than solved them. It was part of, of the problem rather than a solution in their eyes. This is a very uh, common view am among American economists in particular, 
that uh, already in the 1990s warned against establishing the euro without uh, effective fiscal transfer system. Just to make matters worse, worse uh, according to these experts, was also the fact that whilst policymakers knew what reforms were required, they lacked popular support. And this was even worse because they lacked popular support both on the national and on the European levels. Lack of popular support for national level structural reforms and lack of popular support for European level, for Europe level uh, political reforms, reforming the euro system and reforming the governance system of the European Union as a whole. The same uh, National Intelligence Council report then outlined three scenarios how Europe might look like in 2030. The first scenario was the collapse scenario where not only did the European uh, economic governance system collapse, but also this economic uh, collapse would lead into political uh, collapse in the existing European institutions and in their functionality. The euro system would disintegrate, leading into even worse disintegration in the core areas of integration, such as the common market, the internal market, uh, Europe's common foreign and security policy, and other important areas, and true achievements of, of Europe over the decades. Nonetheless, this scenario was thought to be uh, unlikely, the probability was low, but nonetheless it was listed because it was the one that would carry with it serious international risks. Uh, risks from the point of view of the international economy, but also from the point of view of the global governance, the global political governance where the voice of the European Union would no longer be heard and an important ally for the United States would be seriously weakened. The second NIC uh, report uh, scenario is the slow decline scenario, where Europe would escape from the worst crisis, uh, it would somehow recover economically from where it was in the worst moments of the crisis, the recession would eventually end, but structural reforms would fall short, meaning that Europe would not catch up with the rest of the world and it would not be able to return on the path of regaining competitiveness, competitiveness and productivity, meaning again that Europe would experience years of low economic growth. Its institutions would, would function but they would lack legitimacy. They would still go on but still uh, facing trouble year after year. The third uh, scenario here uh, is the Renaissance, the European Renaissance uh, scenario. This is by, by far the most optimistic one of the scenarios in this report, uh, but it builds on Europe's historic historical uh, performance, where a pattern of crisis and renewal uh, has somehow, according to the authors of the report, have been characteristic to the way in which Europe has reinvented itself on several occasions uh, in its history. In this case, uh, this pattern of crisis and renewal would lead into what the authors call a federalist leap in the core of Europe. If not all, all around, in, if not in every single part of the current European Union, this would nonetheless lead into a, a, a federalist, a deepening of a federalist union in the core of today's European Union. In addition to these two examples, there were many, many others, other, others who tried to see into the future during the crisis in 2010 to 2013. There were many that saw the future as, as very bleak indeed, and there were those that saw the crisis as an opportunity to change the face of the European Union as we know it.
uh, what was characteristic to the views expressed during the crisis was a certain polarization of these views. I think the middle ground, uh, especially in 2011 and 2012, when there was a real risk of a systemic collapse in the euro zone, uh, the middle ground somehow lost and the, the voices that were the loudest were the ones that saw the future in the fairly black and white terms. This is characteristic, of course, to the crisis situation when there was a considerable uncertainty about the future. Then these kind of fears or hopes uh, emerged. First of all, we have the doomsday scenarios during the crisis that saw uh, the, an imminent collapse in the European economic system leading into a collapse in the political system. There were economists uh, making predictions about the imminent downfall of the Eurozone. There were Eurosceptic political movements, uh, more or less uh, speaking in the same terms. And especially the English language or the United Kingdom press and analysts were increasingly and, and very critical about the prospects of the current European Union and especially the Eurozone to survive from this crisis. Some think tanks uh, pro uh, produced uh, papers uh, saying more or less the same thing. But there was a systemic meltdown imminent. Euro the Euro was on several occasions uh, given only days to survive. There was a political collapse, a complete political collapse and of, and of authority uh, predicted in the worst crisis countries, leading into even uh, the use of force again on the European continent. But on the other side, uh, and on the other hand, there were also those that saw the crisis as a true and real opportunity for Europe to renew itself. Uh, we can see uh, as a resurgence of feroist divisions uh, during the crisis, and not only on the level of uh, federalist politicians and political movements, but also in papers produced by key EU institutions, such as the European Commission and uh, the European Council President's report in the autumn 2012, outlining uh, what a true economic and monetary union uh, would look like, uh, presenting a considerable deepening of the current economic and monetary union into a true fiscal union with all that came with that concept. This uh, vision was more or less uh, buried in the European Council of December 2012, but nonetheless it's an important report because it represented the joint views of these institutions. Also an important part of this call for a more federalist uh, of federal, uh, stronger uh, European Union with stronger institutions was a, a call for political uh, and European solidarity. Okay, now when we look at the situation now in January 2014, and when we look back to the, the futures that were presented in the past, uh, what might be the likely uh, or imaginable futures that we can see now from the perspective of 2014 when there's still uh, import, uh, serious uncertainty about the state of the European Union, uh, about its economic conditions, and also uncertainty about the political developments that, uh, that are underway? and also the political will that there might be behind different solutions. Nonetheless, we can see a reversal from the black and white thinking, uh, a reversal from the utopias and dystopias, and we can see in, in, in the discussion today a moderation of views. There are still several futures that are anticipated for Europe as a whole, but nonetheless uh, these views have become uh, more uh, moderate in many ways. Here I will only present two different alternatives. I will not go into, into discussing a, a very federalist or federal uh, vision of Europe in the future. 
it may come, it may happen, but right now I don't think it is very likely that the European Union will develop into a political federation uh, according to the vision of the Federalists or indeed the visions outlined in the European Commission and the Council of Presidents reports from 2012. First alternative uh, that, that I present here is a European integration that would still uh, go forward but in very small steps and the current European uh, Union institutions would be only marginally fixed. It would be unlikely that there would be a major treaty change and Europe would somehow just muddle through from its present crisis. Here, the anchors that would still uh, give the momentum for uh, European integration and for these for the European Union institutions would be the single market, its various uh, dimensions, and its continuing the deepening and development, a very big single market uh, in global terms even. And, and then also, on the other hand, also an increased need for a common foreign and security or foreign and defense policy uh, because of uh, the developments outside in different parts of the world would call for this kind of uh, uh, pooling of, of policy competencies. But in this scenario, there would be only limited progress in economic and fiscal governance reform. The current institutions and arrangements would pretty much would be pretty much what we what we would get in the future as well. The second scenario here, and indeed the scenario that I myself personally think is more likely than the first one, and far more likely than, than any visions of a, a federalist leap that were outlined in the, in the reports I just uh, uh, presented to you. Here we would see a Europe of simultaneous integration and fragmentation, and this would indeed be a historical change in Europe. We would move from a multi-speed Europe where all the European Union member states and those that seek its membership are moving into the same direction into what we call the variable geometry Europe. It would not be the same Europe. It would not be the, the same institutional arrangements for all European Union memberships, mem member countries. And this would be more or less a permanent state of, affair, of, of affairs. Some countries would go further. There would be further integration at the core. Uh, these countries would, would be parts of the Eurozone, but they would also develop uh, a joint fiscal uh, capacity. Here, the, the leap in this smaller group of countries, there would be uh, a leap, a kind of, some kind of a federalist leap. There would be a full banking union sharing of liabilities, solidarity, fiscal federalism happening among countries that were ready and willing for this kind of a, a change if we think about what the situation is today. But then there would be the rest, and the rest might indeed be a very large number of countries. The rest of the European Union members would participate selectively in the deeper forms of integration. There would be permanent opt-outs. Some countries would not share the vision of the core countries and would remain on the sidelines uh, in this respect. One important thing, thing here to note is that this division between the core and the rest might not necessarily follow any clear geographic uh, boundaries. Countries from different parts of today's geographical Europe might be able to, to take part in the core. It doesn't necessarily mean only countries uh, bordering immediately uh, the old member states like Germany, uh, Holland and other countries, of indeed France, but also countries that have relatively recently joined uh, the European Union might want to take part in this kind of a deeper form of integration at the core. Now, we need to 
of course, assess the likelihood of different scenarios. We can imagine different futures, but it's important for us also to think about the political processes that may lead into different futures for two reasons. We need to think about the changes and the political decisions that are necessary for change that we want. But then also, as analysts, we need to think about the likelihood of certain political decisions to be made. And here I present you with, uh, with a simple template of assessing uh, these kind of things. I divide uh, here uh, decisions or institu institutional change or, or particular policies or reforms into ones that have either lower or higher economic cost or lower and higher political cost. Economic cost, of course, is fairly straightforward. Uh, a failed economic reform has high economic costs. Recession or depression has high economic costs. Uh, a successful uh, reform may have low economic costs. We have to think also in terms of time and time scale here, but nonetheless, the economic costs of different policy changes and reforms are either lower or higher. The political cost is also uh, one that we need to think about. A successful reform uh, may have a low political cost, but then also a successful political reform may have a high political cost if the people don't like the reform. This is what may happen before elections, when reforms are then rewarded with the, with, with the, with the election outcome. We may have a, a party, political parties engaged in reforms and then losing the next election when we can see a high political cost for those reforms or decisions. And here, what I would like to ask you to do would be to use this template and fill it in with different futures or different alternatives uh, or things that might be done in the future and think uh, what kind of costs these decisions or reforms may or processes may have. Any politician would want to be located in the low, low corner of this, uh, of this uh, uh, graph. You would have low political costs, low economic costs, and you would be a very successful manager of your country's fortunes. Here, I just show you briefly uh, a model I, where I, you, a model for this, for how you could use this template, uh, explaining certain things that I, I then think might have higher or lower political and economic costs, uh, and then you can you can use this as a as a starting point for your own discussion and, and uh, deliberation. And you may also disagree with the, with the way I, in which I have uh, seen the costs of various things. But you might agree with me that a total systemic collapse in Europe, prolonged recession, prolonged austerity policy would have a high economic cost and a high political cost for everybody. At the moment, it seems that the muddling through strategy that I also outlined as one of the possible scenarios for the European Union in the future might be the one that carries the lowest political cost right now and indeed may have a relatively low economic cost if it coincides with a favorable economic cycle in the global economy. Lastly, and to end this lecture, I, let's have a quick look at the near future. We don't really know uh, what will happen by 2020 or 2030. We can imagine, we can think about it, we can talk about it. But now in 2014, uh, there certainly will be some things that will happen and there are some question marks then uh, about these uh, things that are going on. First of all, Today, this year, we'll have the European parliamentary elections in May. Now, the question is whether there will be a new political balance in the parliament and what would be the significance of the outcome of the election 
for the governance reforms in Brussels, be they in the economic sphere or more broadly in the way Brussels functions and is accountable to the citizens of Europe. We will see, but right now it's hard to say which way this will go. The second thing is the implementation of the banking union that took a leap forward last, uh, in the last uh, December. But there are still open issues and question marks about the functioning of the banking union and the extent into which it, it includes uh, elements of joint liability. We don't know how efficient this will be, whether it will, will really be enough for the future banking crisis in Europe. The third thing is whether the economic crisis, whether the worst of the economic crisis is over, uh, as Jose Manuel Barroso in his statement uh, earlier this month said. Is 2014 uh, the year which in retrospect will be seen as the end of the Great Recession in Europe that started uh, after the financial crisis in 2008? But then there the question mark is what are the long-term effects of the crisis and of the recession or depression we have seen in Europe over the last years. Again, this is something we will only see uh, when we wait, wait and see and see how things turn out. The fourth issue that will be salient still uh, in today in this year's European Union politics is where, what kind of a reconfiguration will take place in Europe's external relations. And here, three areas are important. First one is Europe's, the European Union's relationship with the United States, the uh, transatlantic Atlantic relationship. What kind of a role will the European Union play in the future in U the United States' global policy? In an era where the Afghanistan and Iraq wars will be a part will be a part of US and Europe's history rather than the present. Related issue here is the the way in which the uh, the, the trade talks will go uh, between the European Union and the United States. The second area of interest is what goes on outside Europe's own borders. How stable or unstable this neighborhood of ours will be in the future and what kind of influence Europe will have outside its own borders is again an issue that we'll see something uh, happening this year as it has uh, in, in the years past as well. And then if we look at the global level, then it is important to look at what goes on uh, with the other economies and the other political powers, the emerging political powers and economic powers around the world and how this changes uh, Europe's position globally. We could talk about BRICS, MINTS, CIVETS, NEXT11 and all that. And this is related closely to the discussion about Europe's competitiveness, the productivity of its economy, its capacity for renewal, that is not only uh, economic but also political, social and cultural. Thank you very much.